thank you very much for uh, getting up early enough to uh, come here. And uh, this actually was made about 10 years ago. And uh, then uh, our dream was to try and introduce uh, technology and, and the possibilities of technology to the human rights movement as a service uh, to all the human rights organizations. Um, and our dream then was to give cameras to the world and try and uh, create a situation where lots of cameras were uh, being distributed. But in reality, the phone companies, uh, phone manufacturers have done that job pretty well and the world has changed and we now have the internet. And so now the, uh, the dreams are very different. Uh, I knew very little about human rights um, in uh, the 80s when I was busy making music and touring around the place. And, uh, but I got a call from Bono uh, to join this amnesty um, tour called Conspiracy of Hope, which uh, Jack Healy had put together to go across the United States. And that was a very powerful experience for me. And then um, there was some plotting to try and do a version of that tour around the world. And for me, it was an extraordinary education. It was the first time you know, that I had met people who'd been tortured, that I talked to someone you know, whose boyfriend had been thrown out of an airplane or who'd really experienced what I'd only read about or seen in small items on the television before. And I found it very diff difficult to just walk away and go back to doing what I was doing before. Um, and what I found extraordinary was that people could suffer in extraordinary ways, and then very effectively have their experience denied, buried, and forgotten. And it seemed that whenever there was uh, video, photos, that it was much harder to bury the story, and it was much harder for people's experience to be forgotten and discarded. And uh, we made this proposal to the Reebok Human Rights uh, Foundation then, and, and it was adopted uh, after a couple of years but when the Rodney King incident um, happened. And then people saw very clearly that if you happen to have a camera in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, depending who you are, uh, you can get things done much more effectively with that evidence. And, and since then, the organization um, has really evolved in lots of ways, but it's always been based on innovation and trying to think how we could apply the new possibilities and potential of, of technology. One of the things we learned that it wasn't enough just to get a camera out to, uh, to a remote location, uh, that actually we had to spend some time training people. Um, and so now the, the uh, groups that go out around the world and, and train not just the people that get our cameras, but, but other groups as well. Uh, we found we had to become more of a production facility, a, a library, uh, so there's stuff for editing and for archiving and staff employed for that. And, and actually, the cost of the camera sort of diminished into the uh, cost of making this thing real. But um, it has been transformed, and, and particularly un, under the stewardship of our wonderful director down there. But it still only reaches small numbers of groups and, and helps transform uh, techniques of using these technologies uh, that still only touches relatively small numbers. And the dream at the beginning was to try and allow access to everyone. And now we have this extraordinary thing, the internet. Uh, the dream of, of coming up with a sort of YouTube for human rights has become a reality, and we're going to launch that this year. And that would allow anyone from any place in the world the chance of telling their story and having it uploaded, seen. Uh, and at that point, um, we try and connect it 
to those people that may be able to influence things and change the situation. But hopefully, people will not suffer in the way they have previously and then be forgotten and discarded. Um, and it's very exciting for me that that's now getting near completion. But perhaps at this point, would be a good moment to bring in our Generalissima, as we call her, um, who has transformed witness uh, from really an idea uh, that was touching a few people into something that's going to touch millions. Uh, Gillian Caldwell. Thanks. Am I, um, I think I'm wired. Um, so Peter and I are going to stay up here and, and keep it informal. I'm just going to talk us uh, through the hub for a few minutes, and maybe we can have a bit of a conversation. I'm sure there will be questions after I tell you what we plan to do. Um, as, as Peter suggested, the, what stayed consistent over time is our focus on empowering people to use visual media to make a difference. What has continued to innovate and adapt and evolve, of course, as technology has evolved, is how we do that. So when we talk about empowering people to make a difference in human rights using visual media and communications technologies, we're doing it in three distinct ways. Uh, we have our core partnerships, and those are about a dozen relationships. They're campaign-specific relationships with human rights groups who are locally based in countries all over the world. We'll usually have two to three in Africa and the Middle East, two to three in Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe and the FSU, and, and of course, we'll focus on the United States as well at any given point in time. And for those campaigns, we're working with partners who have identified a key problem, who are beginning to articulate a solution, and we're helping them conceptualize a piece of visual media that defines with clarity the problem, the solution, and that speaks to the people, the stakeholders who are capable of leveraging the solution to the problem. So this is what we're calling video advocacy, using video as a tool, as evidence, as a, a vehicle for a, a screening before a targeted key decision maker to educate and activate an audience at a local level, national or international level around an issue, through viral campaigning on the net, which is frankly where we're not seeing as much leverage. Um, and of course, working with the media when and where we can in strategic ways, ensuring that the media broadcast is leveraged by associated offline uh, publicity. So that's the core partner work. We'll work on those campaigns one to three years, measuring concretely the goals and objectives we set out. For example, we want to reduce the voluntary recruitment of child soldiers into the armed forces in the Congo. For example, we want to ensure that people who enslave people in Brazil are punished and land is confiscated when and where they have clearly violated the law. There's law in the books, it's not being enforced. So uh, that's, the core, that's the core partner work. Now, as Peter suggested, I mean, how do you get to scale? You can't do that in an intensive, in-depth way we're for 12 organizations around the world and achieve scale because we have, as we all are, are all aware, an enormous challenge in front of us in terms of human rights broadly defined. So we, we introduced something called the Seeding Video Advocacy Program. And with that, the notion is how do we plant the seeds of video advocacy and percolate the field and learn from, in an iterative way, innovative new approaches to using media and communications technologies to address human rights issues. So through our seeding program, which are short-term workshops between a half a day long and our immersive video advocacy institute, which we're launching in July 07, we do case study driven introductions to video advocacy. We'll bring examples from our partners all over the world and we'll get into dialogue and debate. And through that seeding video advocacy program, we know because we're doing longitudinal analysis that people are actually making effective use of visual media. We're not doing technology transfer. We're not t teaching them how to shoot, produce, and edit films. We're just giving them strategic communications concepts. And they're leaving those workshops um, an anecdotal number of them, but still a significant number, and making a difference. An, an environmental impact statement was uh, forced uh, in, in Mexico as a direct result of a seeding workshop, somebody who took visual media to make a difference. So the seeding program is another big piece. And the third sort of leg of the stool, as we would think about it, because these are all mutually reinforcing initiatives, is the hub. And that's what we wanted to present to you today. And as Peter said, it, you know, we'll be launching this if all goes well soon. Um, 
The hub, I'm just going to be showing you static imagery. It's not actually the design, but it's to explain the functionality. It's a, it's a website, um, what I like to call a you my Wikitube for human rights. So think YouTube, MySpace, Wikipedia, plus advocacy. And um, the notion here is that you would, um, basically it would be the central online destination for human rights related media, whether it's audio, video, or pictures. Um, uh, anybody could upload, act on, interact with, and see human rights related media. They would, of course, be able to search it according to subject matter or country or the user and be able to create and engage in and activate online discussion and offline action surrounding what it is that they see. Um, and of course, the ultimate goal here is not just to educate people, but to deter and reduce and address pressing human rights problems that we face. So we have three basic sets of functionality. We have a see it, an upload it, and a get active, not necessarily in that order. Um, again, here we're going to have what we're calling instru uh, instru a whole instructional design module. So when you get to the site, if you've never before uploaded content to the net, you would have an interactive um, learning tool, which is specifically designed for on, online use that would explain the safety and security risks, the actual physical process, um, and uh, how to tag your media so that people can actually search and find it. Um, if, then you could have your own page, much like you would on MySpace, where all of your visual media is actually stored and can be searched. Um, and people will, let's just say, um, we, your uh, Reuters, journalist covering uh, Africa. And there's two or three users that you're aware of that are uploading really pertinent content and you want to track them. You could subscribe to an RSS or really simple syndication feed to get information, notification in your, in your inbox whenever that content emerges. Or you could subscribe to a feed more broadly pertaining to an issue of interest. I'm interested in child soldiers globally and get information, get uh, e emails in your box whenever that whenever that information is uploaded. Um, this brings us to the issue of content review and how we're going to manage that, one of the most complicated aspects of this project. Um, the notion here, and this is where Wikipedia comes in, is that we need to step one, we need to move ourselves one step further from the control and production of the content. In a core partner relationships, the whole purpose is to enable our human rights partners to articulate themselves on their own behalf, in their own voices. We are not substituting our judgments for theirs. We're empowering them. We're giving them a platform from which they can make a difference and articulate their solution for, uh, to the problems they, they witness. In this context, we realize that in order to take advantage of a new participatory media landscape, we have to take a step back and enable people to dialogue and debate and contest and challenge the realities that are presented here. So the first tier of review is going to be very, very minimal. And basically, it's necessary in any participatory media site to do some review for pornography. If you don't, in fact, you'd be shut down instantaneously by most, go most governments around the world. So we have to be doing a, a review for pornography. And in fact, there is some proprietary LTU technology, which enables you to screen that out, at least with still imagery. Um, and then, of course, some copyright infringement analysis. People are going to have to say that they own the rights to the material. And we all know that Viacom recently sued Google on exactly this point. So there are some challenges afoot in terms of copyright infringement. Um, so it moves pretty instantaneously within a day to a territory which is unreviewed. Um, that's not heavily publicized from the site when you get to it. Um, but this unreviewed territory is a place where both staff and the community of users that we hope to grow very rapidly over time will be able to respond to, flag, and rate the content for accuracy, for authenticity, for relevance, and be able to comment on it. When you upload your media, you would be encouraged to tag it so that we know what it relates to, what country it's from, to provide links and text-based background about the circumstances under which it was shot. But it may be that you're somebody who's fabricated the content. And it may also be that we've developed, over time, a powerful 
group of constituents who care about the media, who care about the community that they're involved in, who will contest and debate, and may flag that content. One of the most important, and I think most, uh, re for most frequently used flags, will be non-human rights related content. When we're talking human rights, we're talking very broadly, in technical terms, civil, political, social, economic, and cultural. I mean, we are thinking extremely expansively. There will be a lot of climate collapse-related concerns here that relate to human rights issues. If we can't breathe the air, if we can't drink the water, for example. But um, there may be stupid pet tricks as well, which just don't qualify. So, um, so, so that unreviewed area will, uh, will be a combination of a minimal staff input in terms of review and a community of constituents that we're building. And then we move to the third area, which is reviewed content. So it's made it through. We know it's human rights related, broadly speaking. And, um, and uh, then we get into the area where there will be some editorial voice, and we'll have featured content, video of the day, the video of the week. And these would be feeds, which would then be syndicated to relevant press. Um, this is a see it page. So you get thumbnails. You'd have an example, names and locations and creators. You'd be able to score. And again, people would develop, like you might in eBay, karma or um, reputational points on the, on the basis of the strengths of their submissions to the community. You may ultimately accrue greater editorial privileges on the basis of your value to the community over time, thinking very open source, very bottom up about how this community emerges. These are groups, so you can mobilize. If you, let's just take one scenario. A humanitarian aid worker in Darfur happens to be um, at the scene of the crime as the genocide continues to unfold, uploads content anonymously to the extent that's feasible. There's a lot of security issues we're dealing with here, as you can well imagine. And um, the Save Darfur Coalition in Washington, D.C., knows that the Congressional Subcommittee looking to consider appropriations to increase security forces on the ground is meeting tomorrow. They download, because we'll have download burned to DVD functionality, uh, 15 copies of the imagery uploaded yesterday and hand deliver it to the members of the Congressional Subcommittee. All this can be working through the power of the internet and of the range of community with different points of access and opportunity in a given situation. So that's how these groups would work, both for discussion and mobilizing online and offline activity. And we'll, of course, have petition functionality, um, email to fax functionality to enable people to speak out. This is a long list of security requirements which we can go into at another point in time if you want. But I think that's probably enough by way of uh, essential background, and um, in the interest of an open source dialogue, maybe we could take any questions, Peter or myself. Yeah, I'd just like to, to make one point, too, that uh, I think is very important, that this is not designed to compete with any other human rights organization, but to serve. Uh, we've been trying to uh, engage and have, having good conversations with a lot of the existing uh, people in the human rights world. So it is really being designed as an open service to everyone. Yeah, I should have mentioned, I mean, this will be presented in association with dozens of organizations around the world. We're building memorandums of understanding with what we're calling content, outreach, media, and technology allies. So Akamai, for example, which is you know, one of the robust uh, media management systems, will be providing pro bono bandwidth to serve all this data. Um, Amnesty International will be signing on as a content partner, will have their own territory, will there be uploading media and calling for media from their national chapters. Human Rights Watch, Americans for Informed Democracy, and a whole range of organizations throughout the world, um, including media organizations, as I mentioned, a Reuters, a Yahoo, a YouTube, um, to whom we would be percolating content. Excuse me, uh, Prime Minister, but, um, when, are, when are you actually launching? Well, there'll be a, a password protected beta on June 11th, um, and we will launch in the <coughs> fall, but we'll probably be live sooner than that, on or around August 20th. Yeah. So
So Witness will finance and minister and manage the project. Um, it will be built in a Drupal open source platform and we'll be integrating commons licensing so that we will not claim ownership of any content that's uploaded. People will have a, a, a range of options in terms of licensing and we will encourage, our default option will be an option that encourages the most viral use um, of the content distribution with attribution and ability to remix the content as well. Hi, I'm, can you hear that? Yep. yep. Good. I'm William Heath. I do the Ideal Government blog, which asks, what do we want from e-enabled services in the information age? I think this is definitely an idea whose time has come. We've been looking at Ideal Government, or we look at government surveillance and so forth for a long time. Have you come across this term, surveillance, as well? It's, it's the counterpart to surveillance. It's when surveillance, instead of being done from on top, oh. is done from underneath. Great. So y you are taking surveillance global, and there's a tiny community of surveillance enthusiasts. I think what you're doing um, underlines a principle that we, we, we often see, which is that artists spot the real importance of social and technical trends way before governments do. I would, I've got a couple of thoughts about what you're doing. Um, you're aware of the risk of kind of pure prurient attention. I mean, if you've got videos of torture or whatever it is, uh, you may attract either censorship or an interest which is uncomfortable, and you'll leave people to, to ready to sort of deal with that. I think the other thing is what you're doing is very threatening to existing networks in a number of ways. You know, news channels like to be the ones that broadcast Darfur into your evening sitting room. And so don't expect them to be happy about what you're doing. It's very odd how negatively uh, existing power structures react to constructive, sensible things, which are hello, <laughs> which are, which are being done. But I mean, essentially, more strength to your arm. Delighted you're doing it. Thank you, Peter, for lending your name, reputation, and network to something which sounds really, really important. Do you want to respond? Well, I mean, the only thing I would say about that is we're not trying to drive all the traffic to this site. I mean, we're actually going to be platform agnostic. The goal, in fact, is to syndicate it to as many sites as possible. And, and as we know, legacy media is really struggling with the challenge of how to incorporate, invite, and, and, and involve sort of a citizen journalism component into the work that they're doing. So I, I, we, are, you know, we are getting positive response from media, and I, and I hope we will uh, as the thing launches get, get increased interest. So. Am I on? I would just echo what was said. This is a tremendous effort and you should be congratulated for it. I'm interested though specifically, I'm Tim Keene from St. Louis University. I'm interested in two things specifically. You mentioned in passing the seeding video advocacy as sort of a case study approach um, I'd like you to exp expound on that a little bit. And then secondly, you, you also mentioned kind of in passing this idea of incenting people over time, you know, to sort of raise their um, authority, I guess, within the system so they could get editorial control and so forth. Could you expound on that as well? So, so when we talk about a case study driven approach, um, it actually isn't entirely accurate to describe it that way because it's a very interactive workshop and the goal would be for people to leave uh, the longer workshop, say a, a workshop of a day or more with what we call a video action plan. So they would have a concrete um, framework regarding you know, the problem they're trying to address, the solution, the stakeholders, the production schedule, the distribution strategy. But we're using case studies, um, again, not formally in an academic context, case studies that have been fully uh, drafted and prepared, but, but examples, comprehensive examples of how visual media has been used in a variety of circumstances and to what effect. Um, and, with, and with regard to editorial privilege, um, you know, that remains to be seen. I think that everybody is going to have and everybody will be encouraged to rate content. And Peter's often talked about Francis Ford Coppola's site and how, um, you know, t to upload music to the site, you know, you're required to... Or scripts and... Script. Yeah, I think it was, it was a sort of peer, peer... It was one of the early peer review setups where if you wanted your content on, you had to evaluate and score, I think, four other pieces of work. Um, it was mainly sort of story, short stories, script ideas, and so on. But, but that technology is now pretty common, and um, 
and is a pretty reliable way of getting uh, what needs to be seen to the top. I mean, I think there we wouldn't want, obviously, to create any barrier to entry in, your, in an emergency context. You know, we're not going to require you to, you know, to, to review a bunch of other content, but there would be that active encouragement, particularly once you become a more regular user, to try to get you more actively engaged. And, and then we'll also, through the content management system we're developing, be able to reach out to particular users with particular expertise in particular areas of the world. You might not have seen some new content emerged. It's quite controversial. Can you please? Please reflect on it. You know, how do you see it? How do you analyze it? Like that. Rooney, our former program. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, oh, Heather's waving at the top. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Lucia Huberman from the BBC. I'm really pleased that you're near to launch. I've been watching this project grow for some time. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, if you take the Darfur example that you used just, just now, um, somebody sees something they shoot a piece of video, it's uploaded, you burn it to DVD, it goes to Congress, that kind of scenario. How um, can you verify the content? And secondly, how can you protect the people who are uploading the content and shooting the content? Not only the people who are shooting, but the faces of the people that they're describing, because obviously there are repercussions, and it is hard to protect um, identity and location from an IP address. I know it's possible, but it's, it's still very difficult. So in technical terms, um, what we're leaning towards is a choice not to maintain any log files, um, which, is a, which gives you a big challenge in terms, of course, of how you can assess the traffic um, from various parts of the world, and people are using aliases, and you don't have log files, and therefore you cannot respond to a subpoena to provide the log files. This is part of the reason we had to move away from um, customizing an off-the-shelf solution or uh, taking a white label solution, something like Ning, which has you know, quite a bit of the functionality we're interested in. But we did speak to Mark Andreessen, who founded Netscape and who started Ning, and a couple of others, Rever, YouTube, to see if we could customize those platforms and meet our security requirements. And we really found that we can't. And we were advised by everybody to create a mashup in technical terms. Um, to avoid the, uh, the, the problem of the log files, which is exactly how you would um, designate uh, the IP address. Then we're also going to have to have an edit functionality so that as people upload the content, they can digitize or obscure faces. Security warnings simply <coughs> described in multiple languages. And again, in the context of witness staff editorial control, a very keen eye to when and where there may be safety risks that people aren't recognizing. If somebody uploads imagery inside a sweatshop of a bunch of undocumented workers, and the imagery is powerful and shows the conditions under which people are working in, in Queens, in New York City. Um, we want that imagery there, but we don't want those workers and their families deported. So there's going to have to be a lot of that kind of analysis, which is why we want an interesting mix of staff who have both the human rights-related sensibility and an understanding of alternative media, journalism, and those landscapes. Can I just add to I think on the, the I mean they're both very good points on the, the verification issue. You know, if this thing scales up, it's a, a real um, potential problem. But I think you know we're taking the attitude that Wikipedia have taken, and, and, and although we will have as many experts as we can afford, we are going to have to rely on a larger community, um, and uh, there are bound to be some mistakes, uh, and there are real risks. Uh, but we're doing our best to um, to minimize those. But you know, if you look at the analyses that have been done, um, it, it appears that Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica have roughly equivalent equivalent accuracy rates. So, um, which is a remarkable thing. So, it's a really about the power of community and numbers, and it's and it's dangerous to keep. Drawing on the Wikipedia analogy, because there you have two to three hundred power users, unpaid power users, who are remarkably committed to that community, and um, I hope you know a hundred of you will become those power users to help us with authentication. But I think we're going to have to be very clear that we cannot vouch for the authenticity of the content. When and where we feature content, we're going to say we've done everything we can to authenticate. Um, but I, th I think we're going to have to step, a sh you know, stand a, a step short of um, absolute. Uh, verification, unless there's a context in which we, we really do know the user and can go that far. Um, so first of all, 
I'm so excited that this is happening. So it's really, I want to congratulate you. A um, couple of things that have come up for me. Um, first of all, t two questions and one concern. Uh, there's a question around language, both in terms of the user, what languages it's going to be available in, but also in your vetting <laughs> process. If there's language involved and the linguistic capacity of witness is exceeded, how do you vet in terms of what's being said if there's a danger, safety, security issue? That's one. The second is around, um, I'm concerned about the peer review component for controversial and contested issues. Peer review works really well for uncontroversial issues. It's very problematic. Um, it becomes a battleground in and of itself. Like, I'm now dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We can't use Wikipedia because it's become a battleground. And I can foresee that, you know, Parvez doing gay, gay rights issues in Islam. I mean, that will become, if, if a threshold has to be met for popularity and it becomes a, a battleground, you will have gatekeepers on some of the most marginalized populations. So I'm just, those are two questions in terms of how you'll handle it. I, and I think on Wikipedia they actually had to freeze the uh, Israel-Palestine yeah. co conflict. So, um, yeah, these are very real issues. And, I mean, I, I think we're not fully naive. But there's going to be a huge learning curve here. And, uh, and for sure, yeah, we need to be available in all languages. Um, but that's not a realizable goal at first. So. We, I think we just do the best we can with the community that we can attract. The, the language, uh, what we're doing obviously is a stage beta release over time, um, increasing the, func the technical functionality. And what, what we plan to do is to launch in French, English, and Spanish in terms of navigation now. Interestingly, you know, that doesn't even cover a fraction of the world's population. But of course, you start with romance because of you know, the issue of reading from right to left, and you're familiar. <laughs> so. Um, it's much more technically complex, but we are also going to be integrating technology uh, called DotSub, which basically enables on-the-fly subtitling. So the vid, and, and in fact, we've already experimented with this at a vlog on, on, on Global Voices. So people, as imagery is uploaded, would be able to sublet, subtitle that imagery. And we could call for subtitling of the content because, of course, a lot of times it is precisely the verbal content that is going to make the, you know, that make the clip relevant. Um, so we're thinking a lot about language as a short answer to the question. I think we're getting a sign that um, our time is rapidly coming to an end. So, uh, if, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I was, are we done at 10? Is that right? Does anybody know? That's it. We, okay. okay. So I think, yeah, for, for other sessions, we, we need to say goodbye and thank you all very much for coming. It means a lot to us. Thank you.